Well, chapter 11 is the study of gases. And so what we're going to learn about is what makes gases unique well, relative to solids and liquids. Um, gases, you have to think about it when we talk about it. We have to bring up a subject called kinetic molecular theory. Okay, So that sounds a little bit scary, but let me explain it to you with a picture. So imagine you have, oops, let me get a pen here. Imagine that you have a container. Right? And you're putting a gas in it. Now, if I said you were putting a solid in it, what would you draw? I mean, think about that for a second. Now, you probably would have thought, oh, yeah, a bunch of particles close together for the solid. So there'd be one here, and then one next to it, one next to it, one next to it. And you'd probably come up with a very similar thing with liquids. With liquids, you would put the particles close together. But what would the difference be? I mean, if you think about what the difference is... It's probably that liquid molecules can move around each other. And we relate the ability to move around to each other to a couple of different things. And one of that is, is how strongly attracted the molecules are. And we also attribute it to temperature. So let's see how these things play out when we think about gases. For one, when you have a gas, the particles of the gas are far apart from each other. So they're not close like they would be in the liquid. I'm not going to draw a whole bunch. You can imagine like this is a con big container and got lots of particles in it. <clears throat> but then we have to think about these particles being far apart from each other. So the density is low. Okay. And we also have to think about them moving. So, you know, to make them moving, I'm going to put these little like lines like these are the the zoom or swoosh lines of the particle moving. So I know it's not, like I'm not really an artist or anything, but it's the best I can do. So we have these particles. I'm not going to draw them for all of them. But you have these particles, and they're moving around, so they're constantly in motion. So unlike the liquid, they're in motion. The liquid molecules are constantly in motion relative to each other. But... But there's much more space in the gas. Okay, so two things: we have them moving, and there's there are much more space around them than there would be in the other states of matter. So it's low density. Then you have to think about like why would they be that way, right? And there's actually two factors. One is they don't have any any intermolecular forces of attraction. They're just not attracted to each other. When we talked about structures of molecules and dipole, uh, dipoles in molecules, in essence, we're saying, well, they don't have those kinds of forces in them, so they're not attracted or repelled to e by each other. And this is going to be important in a second. I'll talk some more about it. Um, but yes, they're constantly in motion. They're not attracted or repelled uh, to each other. And they're also very small compared to their uh, compared to the space of the container. So, if this container has a space, a volume that uh, is the container's volume, I'll just write container here. That's actually the space with or without these molecules, in essence, because these occupy such a small percentage of the space. It doesn't look like I've drawn it here where the dots are big. They're just really tiny, and most of the space is empty. Now, the other thing, and this is related to the attracted or repelled, is that the energy of the molecules, okay, so uh, molecule energy, is proportional or is related to, let's do that, the temperature. So what does that mean, right? Well, as you increase the temperature, increasing temperature, uh, then you increase the energy. 
And how does that manifest in molecules? And it turns out it, they go faster. Okay, so increasing the temperature increases the energy. It also makes the velocity higher. And that's because temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. So temperature is a measurement of kinetic energy. And you remember from our discussion about forms of energy before, kinetic energy is the energy related to motion. So at a high temperature, particles are going very fast, and at a low temperature, particles are going very slow. We also need to talk, and so those are, these are the four sort of what they call postulates of kinetic molecular theory. Um, there are some things that come out of this, some implications of these ideas. Uh, one is that because the molecules are not repelled or attracted to each other, is they tend to move in straight lines. So they don't curve around in space. And the other uh, important uh, aspect of this is that collisions are elastic. That mean, what that means is when they bounce off of each other, they don't lose any energy just because they're sticky or sticking to each other. They don't repel off of each other either. I mean, they're just going to bounce with no gain. They're going to bounce without a loss or gain of energy. Okay, so when we talk about gases, we also talk about pressures of gases. And so when you think about those gas molecules that are bouncing off, right, like this, and bouncing off a surface and going out like that, so they're moving, right, and here's the surface of the container, uh, they're going to impart a force to the container. Okay, so it turns out if you want to know the pressure in a container or what it, what's causing the pressure of the container, Turns out it's the force of the particles bouncing off the surface divided by the area of the surface. So pressure, by definition, is a force divided by the area. And if you really wanted to calculate what it was, you'd have to calculate how much force each particle gave as it struck the surface. Okay. Now, there's a bunch of different, oh, let me give you another idea, too. So let's say you increase the temperature, and you don't allow the container to get bigger. What happens to the pressure on the inside? Well, many of you know, as you increase temperature, pressure increases. So why does that happen? It happens because the velocity or the kinetic energy of the particles goes up as temperature goes up. That means the force will also increase, which causes an increase in pressure. So kinetic energy, when you increase the temperature, you increase the kinetic energy. That means the force of the particle striking the surface goes up. So that's this part gets bigger, right? And as long as you don't allow the container to get bigger, let's, let's say it's a solid container like a can, then you should see the pressure go up on the inside because of that increased force of collision. Now, there's a lot of weird units uh, that we have in science for measuring pressure. Okay, so we're going to talk about how you measure pressure. Sorry, I took a little break, so there might be a little discontinuity there. So 
Atmospheric pressure has a lot of different units, so I thought it would help to sort of explain how pressure was measured initially, or the first instrument we had, and that was called a barometer. Okay, so a barometer, the original ones were long glass tubes, a little under a meter in length, and they filled them with mercury. So the way they would fill them with mercury is they would take the long glass tube and put it in a barrel of mercury, and then the mercury would fill up the tube, or they would lay it in a trough of mercury, and they would fill up the tube, they would cap it with their finger, and then they would tilt it up. And so when they would tilt it up, they would put it inside the, the modern barometers, if there is such a thing, they just stood it up in a pool of mercury. So that's that dashed line represents the mercury, And the tip of the barometer went down into the mercury like that, okay? Now, when they let go of the mercury, so this whole thing has mercury in it when they start, so Hg, okay, the liquid would drop and then reach a level and stop. And so what's happening is, is that molecules on the outside are trying to get in. So these create a force, and it's divided by an area, but a force divided by an area. This column of mercury is also creating a force. So this is force from gravity, and this is a force from air pressure. So what happens is, is when the force of the gravity and the force of the air pressure are equal, the mercury stops moving down. Now the question is, what's up in here? So take a moment and pause the video and ask yourself what you think might be up in that space. And the answer is a vacuum. What's a vacuum? A vacuum is nothing. So in essence, what happens is, is the mercury falls, there's no pressure from the atmosphere on top of the mercury, right, in this point here. And then the force of the mercury balances the force of the air pressure and stops. Up in the top, it's just a vacuum. It's just the absence of matter, really. There's nothing in that space. Now, as it turns out, the way they measured this is they just took a ruler, basically, and measured how high it is. And they measured it in a unit, uh, which is common to us, called the millimeter, right? And then they would append to it Hg. So now this reads as a millimeter of mercury. Okay, so... The height was always about the same, and it turned out to be about 760 millimeters of mercury. So we have 760 millimeters of mercury as the pressure of the atmosphere that was around them at that time. Now, that really hasn't changed that much. So 760 millimeters of mercury... is what we call one atmosphere. The unit for an atmosphere is an ATM. Now, in the United States, since we don't use uh, metric or SI units very often, when you look up the weather online, what you'll often find in the United States is rather than being measured in millimeters of mercury or atmospheres, it's typically measured in inches, and so it turns out that 200 or 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to 29.92 inches of mercury. Now, here's the weird thing. You can add the HG on the end here. That's what you'll see, like in the newspaper or if you go to the Weather Channel or anything like that. They're often measuring it in, in those units. Um, 
how do you get I mean, how is 760 the same as 29.92 inches well it's what it is is it's a unit conversion so if you said uh, you wanted to know inches and you have 760 millimeters you can convert that to meters and then uh, usually you would go to centimeters and then you can go to inches but when you did all that calculation you would just end up with 29.92 so this is really just a unit conversion of the type that we learned before with the dimensional analysis so 760 millimeters of mercury is 29.92 inches now we also measure things in psi that's pounds per square inch so when you're filling up a car tire or a bicycle tire a scuba tank anything like that it's often measured in units of psi and literally 14.7 pounds per square inch is what one atmosphere is so you could also say over here equals and then write this number down that's over here now think about what that means if you have an inch squared now on my screen this is about an inch squared there's 14 pounds in that inch 14.7 pounds of atmospheric pressure now if you have two square inches right then the force pounds is the force the number of pounds would be 14.7 plus 14.7 so on a surface like your skin there's actually a and you know the square inches are fairly high if you think about it there's a tremendous amount of force on your body from the atmosphere the only reason you don't notice it is because it's always around you the other very important unit to recognize is the pascal and a pascal is the si unit and it's derived from meters squared and uh, kilograms um, what else is in there a couple other units are in there kilogram meter squared per second and the acceleration I'll let's just put it that way for now because it doesn't make sense unless you've had a little physics uh, it's 101,325 Pascals this is also equi equivalent to one atmosphere okay uh, a little side note and it's an important little side note is standard temperature and pressure and when you hear that term in chemistry they often abbreviated STP when you hear that term in chemistry it's one atmosphere and zero degrees Celsius or 273.15 Kelvin so let's do a quick problem it says convert the following your tire air pressure measures 35 psi how many pascals and let's say and atmospheres does this represent so we'll do the calculation real quick I'll, I'll start it what I'll do is I'll pause the video or you should pause the video go video and try to work it out and then you can see the work that I did here um, so here's the answers I hope I paused it long enough I did some editing and chopped some stuff out so we start with what we have and we also write what we're looking for and I want to keep encouraging you guys to work out your problems this way all the time write the unit you're looking for then start with what you're given right and then find your conversions and then calculate your answer and then round to the correct number of significant figures question is where did I get this from right so what I did was this I needed the relationship between at, uh, from PSI and Pascals and what I know is that 14.7 PSI is one atmosphere and 101,325 Pascals is also one atmosphere so I just said 14.7 PSI and you could write it as pounds per uh, inch squared like it says there or you can write it as PSI equals 101,325 Pascals and that's what I use to do the conversion that's right here okay similarly 
Oh, and I rounded to two significant figures because 35 has two significant figures. And similarly, with the PSI directly to atmospheres, I just looked up that one atmosphere is 14.7 PSI, and then I calculated the result, rounding it to two significant figures. So what I'd like to do uh, before I continue on is cover, uh, I call it a little mathematical aside. Uh, it's the idea of directly proportional and inversely proportional. So let's say I have A is equal to C. Oh, let's do K. K is our constant. Okay, K times uh, B. Now, if if we're looking at these uh, units, right, and I say, or these, num these variables, if I say B goes up, what do you say? Right? You probably said A goes up. So if a goes up, B goes up, A goes up, and similarly, if A goes down, then B has to go down. And these are what we would call directly proportional variables, and they're proportional by, you can make an equation, this is known as the proportionality constant. So let's say the number's two, right? Well, if I double, if I increase B by one, then A increases by two because that's what the proportionality constant tells me happens. Now, if you were to graph this, right? And I put, let's say B here, because that's my X and A is my uh, Y value, I would get a straight line starting at zero because if I put a zero in for B, then A would be also zero. And then it would increase at a fixed rate. It's a straight line. And this slope is K. So that's why we call that the slope is the proportionality constant is Y in Y is equal to MX plus B. Now, it turns out, think about pressure, right? Pressure is proportional to the temperature times a constant. Or I could say um, pressure is equal to moles times a constant. Now, the symbol for moles is just going to be N. Now, how do, how do I know that? Or how do you know that, right? And think about a balloon. If you take a balloon and you blow air into it, what happens to it? Well, it gets bigger, right, because you blew air into it. Why is it bigger, though? The answer is because there's more gas on the inside. And the gas, the volume of the gas is going to be proportional to the number of moles of the gas. So we can say sort of fairly uh, definitely, just from our experience, that pressure and temperature are uh, related to are directly proportional to each other. Pressure and moles is directly proportional. <laughs> That's a hard time talking. Proportional to each other. And it also turns out volume is equal to K times N. That's the balloon. But now, let's... Oh, sorry. I said this in the wrong order. Let's do that here. I was talking about volume a second ago, and it, I don't know, it didn't dawn on me. I was using the pressure equation. What happens when you blow into a container and then you don't let the volume change, right? The pressure goes up because you're adding moles into the container. Okay, so there are a bunch of different proportional, directly proportional variables in gas laws. And so it's, I'm sorry, it's important to understand, well, we'll talk about proportionality later. It's sort of important to understand like what that actually means. Now, we also have inverse proportionality, and people don't think about this very often, but because we usually think about directly proportional. But inversely proportional means when something goes up, the other thing goes down, and that's a relationship that looks like this. Okay. Now, it's actually easier to understand it, at least for me it is. It's easier to understand it when I have A times B equals k. And all I did was multiply both sides by b. I'll show the math since like that. And then I get a times b is equal to k because these b's will cancel out. Now when you say this goes up, 
right? And this is constant. That means this has to go down. That's what we mean by inverse proportionality. When one of them increases, the other one has to decrease. So we can write it like this. Now that I've done that once, it's sometimes better just go back to this form. If this goes up, that goes down. All right, so this is going up. That has to go down. On the other hand, uh, if A goes up, what does that mean? Right, so if A is equal to K times 1 over B. If this goes up, that means this had to go down. Okay. Now, if it's easier for you to look at this form, then look at this form. But if it's easier for you to do this, then do that. So what kinds of things are inversely proportional, right? And the, and the one that comes to mind uh, for chemistry is pressure and volume. So it turns out that pressure times a volume is equal to a constant. So if I increase, let me do this. If I decrease the volume, but I don't let anything escape, so I squeeze it, right? What happens to the pressure inside the container? Yeah, so if I take, I have a balloon, let's say, and I squeeze the balloon down, right? And I don't allow anything to escape from the container, then the pressure must be going up inside the container. Here's the other one. This is the way it's a little bit harder to think about. So I have P times V is equal to a constant. If I make the pressure go down, right, then the volume must be going up. And it turns out, even though this sounds a little weird to most people, it's the one that you see the most often. So if you take like a bag of potato chips and you drive to a higher elevation, what happens to the bag of potato chips? And I wish we could have a discussion here, but since we can't, what happens to the bag of potato chips is it gets bigger. The volume increases because at higher elevations, there's less air above you. And so the pressure goes down. And as a result, the volume of the bag goes up. All right. So that's a little aside on direct proportionality and inverse proportionality. Direct means if one goes up, the other goes up. And, or one goes down, the other one goes down. So they always change in the same direction. And inversely proportional, that's like pressure and volume. When one goes up, the other has to go down. And when one goes down, the other one has to go up. OK, so I want to show you a couple of examples. And the way I'm going to show you these is different than uh, what the textbook does. So. Pay attention to what I'm doing, and if it doesn't make sense, there's so many examples in this chapter. I'd like you to just go over there and look at those, and then ask me for help as you go along. As you're going along listening to this lecture, do problems from your book. It's not something you can do in class, but you can have your book open, and I'll be going roughly in the order in the book. And when you hit that section, and you're trying to do problems uh, out of that section, then go ahead and... If you get stuck, just send me a message. OK, so I'm going to present to you something uh, that is no, that are known as the empirical gas laws. Um, and some of it we already we just did. And, and, and empirical gas law means it's a law that was created based on observation. Empirical just means observed laws. So a guy named Boyle, and I'm going to just give you one example, and there's many in the book. But Boyle said, if you take the pressure times the volume of a gas, it's going to give you a constant. All right? Now that's what we use. That's what we use K for. So we're going to use K here. And that, that constant is the same for that same gas as long as you don't allow the moles to change. So N is constant and T is constant. Now, what Boyle said then is since the pressure times the volume is always a constant, as long as you don't change moles and temperature, he wrote an equation that looks like this. So this is Boyle's law. Okay. 
but he may there's a working version of Boyle's law by working version it's I mean it's the one you'll use to solve problems he says pressure at one condition times the volume at one condition it's equal to a constant but that's also going to be equal to the pressure at a second set of conditions and a different volume So take a look at this first problem, and I'm going to come back and I'm going to address a bunch of these, but this is the working form of the equation. Okay? I'm actually going to solve it twice, and I'm, I'll, I'm going to save a little bit of space here on the side, so I'm going to split this down the middle. And actually I'm going to solve it one time, I'll do another problem, and then I'll talk about how you can solve all these generally without memorizing all the equations. Okay? I don't expect you to memorize all the equations, but there's one equation sort of like the uh, Lord of the Rings is one equation to rule them all I don't know if that joke makes sense to you but so let's let's look at this problem it says if the temperature of a gas oh sorry this next problem it's this one down here it says if the volume of 255 uh, centimeters cubed right if a gas has a volume of 255 centimeters cubed at 725 millimeters of mercury, what is the volume at 760 millimeters of mercury? So now what you have to do when you read this problem, you have to say, oh, this is a volume, that's a pressure, and that's a pressure, and I'm looking for a volume. So you see how that reflects Boyle's law. So I'm going to call this 1 and 1 and 2 and 2 like that. So now I know that P1, V1, is equal to P2, V2. I need to find out what the equation for V2 is. I'm going to solve it for V2 because that's what I'm looking for. So I'm going to say V2 is equal to, right, P... Sorry, my mic turned off. P1 times V1 over P2, like that. So what I did is I divided both sides by P2, and these canceled out, right? And that left me with this equation, which is what that is there. So now what I'm left with is plugging in the numbers, right? So P1 is 725 and millimeters of mercury. Well, this line might be a little close, uh, times uh, 255 centimeters cubed, right, divided by 760 millimeters of mercury. That's my P2 that's over here. Now, notice what happens when you do this problem. These units will cancel. So it works out as long as the pressure units and volume units that you're dealing with are the same at the beginning, like the before and the after, then you don't have to go through the process of converting it over to some common unit as long as, or a different unit like atmospheres, for example. So my answer when I do my calculation comes out to be 200. 43.3, um, let's see, what are my units? Centimeters cubed. So I'll round that to 243.3 centimeters cubed. Or sorry, 243, the no.3, I'm just going to round that off, centimeters cubed because I have three sig figs in my problem. Okay? Oh, that's assuming that this is 760. It might actually only be two sig figs, in which case it'll be 2.4 times 10 to the second centimeters cubed. Okay, so that's how you would do these problems. You need to know what the, the empirical gas law is, and then you need to solve it and um, uh, find the values and solve it and plug everything in. So I've listed a bunch of these empirical gas laws that are down here. And a lot of times what people feel like is they have to memorize it. 
But the reason I was saving some space in these problems is to show you that you don't have to memorize it, okay? So to start with, there's one equation you'll have to remember, and it's this one. P times V, okay, is equal to a constant times uh, N and T. So this is a variation of an equation, but uh, it combines all the things that we know about the empirical gas laws. So for example, if I go back to what we were talking about over here, right? I have pressure times volume is equal to a constant. So that's one side of the equation. But we also know that pressure is proportional to temperature and pressure is proportional to moles. And volume is also proportional to moles. So if I combine the P and the V on the one side, I can combine the N and the T on the other side. And that's where that equation comes from. Now, you don't have to derive this equation. You don't have to come up with it on your own. Um, but this is the equation that says that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. Turns out moles and temperature are inversely proportional to each other as well, because if this one goes up, then this one has to go down. Okay. So how does this help us? So I'm going to write this equation out. I'm going to say P1 V1. Oh, actually, let me rearrange this equation first. So I have P times V divided by N times T, that's equal to my constant. And again, what did I do to get that? If you have trouble with this, go ahead and pause it. I'll work it out, and then you can see if you did the right uh, steps, okay? Okay, so what did I do? I just divided both sides by N and T. And that'll cancel like that. And if I divide one side, I've got to divide the other side. Or otherwise, it's not an equation anymore. So that's how I get that equation. So I can say this. And this seems like a lot of work to do this. But I'm going to do this. P1 V1 is equal to, or over N1 T1 is equal to P2 V2 over N2 and T2 like that. This is known as, well, it's a variation of something known as the combined gas law, except in the combined gas law, it doesn't have the moles in it. N is for the moles. So let's see how we use this equation. So I'm going to go back up here all right, to this problem here, and I'm going to say P1 V1 over N1 T1 is equal to P2V2 over N2T2, like that. Now, when you read the problem, right, it says P1 and V1 and P2 and V2. And you notice it doesn't say anything about N and T. So it turns out you can just cross these out, and that gives you your equation. P1V1 is equal to P2V2, and that's the equation we started with, okay? So whatever you're not using, you just cross it out because they're constant. They're the same. So N1 and N2 are the same, and T1 or T2 in the, are the same, and they end up canceling out of the equation. So let's do this problem. We've never worked this kind of problem before. We don't know which gas law it is. I'm just going to write this equation, P1, and I guess I don't need this line anymore, V1 over N1. Sorry, I'm used to saying initial. N1 T1 is equal to P2 V2 over N2 and T2. So let's read the problem and see what uh, equation we're going to use. So it says, if the temperature of a gas starts from, right, increases from 25 to 125. So this is T1 and this is T2 and initially had a volume of V1, 25. What is its final volume? That's V2. So now it's temperature and volume. So what wasn't mentioned? So I want you to cancel out the stuff that wasn't mentioned in the equation and rewrite the equation that we'll be using. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a second to do that. If you pause the video.
Okay, so since pressure and moles were not mentioned, I'm going to cancel them out like this. It means they don't change. And what I end up with is V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. And that's the equation that we would use. That's the working form, right, of, of uh, what's, I don't even know what it is. Oh, it's Guy Lussac's law. Actually, it's not even on here. It's not one that gets mentioned very often. So it's V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. And we're looking for V2. So now what we have to do is isolate V2 in this equation and go ahead and pause the video. If you're having trouble with this, try to do it. And then you can watch what I do. Okay, so I'm going to multiply both sides by T2, right? And that, and then this will cancel on this side. Now I'm going to write it as V2 equals, and then it's V1 times T2 over T1, like that. And now what I do is I look up the values and I plug them in. Now, one warning, in all of these problems, you need to always convert Celsius over to Kelvin. And the equation for converting Celsius to Kelvin is that Kelvin is equal to 273.15 plus the degrees Celsius. Okay, so V1 in this equation is going to be uh, 25 milliliters. And then be careful because this says V1, but this is actually T2. And so T2, I'll have to put that in here, right? And then T1 will be down here. So what we'll do is calculate what those values are and plug them in. So it can be 273.15 plus 125 degrees Celsius. That's uh, going to be 300 and 98.15 Kelvin. And then I have T1, that's 273.15 plus 25 degrees Celsius. And that's going to be 298.15. So plugging in T1, 298.15, And on the top, 398.15, I can carry out my calculation, and that gives me, let me pause for a second, I gotta get my calculator. That ends up being 33 millimeter, uh, milliliters, I believe, milliliters. The Kelvin's cancel, yeah, and that leaves me with milliliters. Well, that's the answer. Sorry, they got a little crowded. I'm writing giant, actually. I should be zooming in and writing, but it just seems easier to do this. Uh, does that make sense? When you think about it, yeah, it does, because if the temperature goes up, you'd expect the volume to go up, and so it went from 25 to 33. So that completely makes, uh, is consistent with uh, what you'd expect for the right answer. Here's another problem. It says a cylinder contains 1.5 moles of gas at a pressure of 35 psi and 26.5 degrees Celsius. If two moles of gas are added and the temperature is decreased by 10 degrees Celsius, what is the final pressure? All right, so let's write out our equation. And then I'm just going to let you work it out. We'll have to zoom in on this one and write small, okay? So I know my equation is P1V1 over N1T1. And that's P2V2 over N2 and T2. And I read through the problem and I see, oh, it talks about moles. And then I add moles. And then it has a pressure, and uh, and it has two temperatures, 
and what does it not talk about? All right, take a second to think about it. All right, so I have moles, this is N, right? And then I have moles, that's N. And then I have 35, which is a P. And I have a 26, which is a T, and a 10, that's a T. So it turns out volume's the only thing that's not mentioned. And it says, what is the final pressure? So that's P2, okay? And T2 is the 10 degrees Celsius. And N2 is what? That's a little trickier, right? Because two moles are added, so the moles inside the container are actually 3.5 moles. So, but that's your N2. And then 35 is your P1. Uh, and 26.5 is your T1, like that. So I have my 1s, I have my 2s, and now I could rearrange the equation. I'm solving it for P2. And then after I do this, I'm going to show you, I've, I've developed another way to do these problems. This is closer in line with what the book does. So I have a different way, and I'm going to show you how to do that too, okay? So um, let's do this real quick. I need to rearrange the equation for P2. So I'm just going to write it. like that and you can work it out just the same way as we did before by multiplying across by things we're trying to get rid of and canceling them out and stuff like that okay so but that's your equation and now what we're going to do is we're going to plug the numbers in and I do have temperatures so the temperatures will have to be converted over to Kelvin but P1 is 35 psi N1 is 1.5 moles, and T, oh sorry, N2, not N1, N2 is 3.5 moles, because we said it was added, and then T2 is 10 degrees Celsius, which is 283.15 uh, Kelvin, like that. Now, I have my N1. My N1 is 1.5 moles. And my T1 is actually 273.15 plus 26.5, which is 299.65 Kelvin. So the Kelvin will cancel. Well, maybe I should use a different color for that. So it'll be a little easier to see if I use a different color, I think. Mm, let's see. Do I have a bright? Yeah, I'll use red. There we go. So the Kelvin will cancel. The moles will cancel. And it'll leave me with a unit of pressure, which is good because that's what I'm looking for. So now what I'll do is I'll say that's equal to... And I'll do my calculator work, and that's going to come out uh, 77 point one six atmosphere or psi like that. Okay. Now uh, it's two significant figures in the problem, um, assuming uh, it's not just one from that. We'll stick with two, so that's 77 psi. Right. Sig figs aren't the big issue here. Just getting these calculations done aren't the big issue. Okay, hopefully that wasn't too confusing. I know it is confusing, but hopefully it wasn't too confusing. I want to show you something else that you can do. If you're having trouble keeping everything organized, I'm going to do that same problem. Um, down here below. So just a second, I'll uh, open up a little bit of, uh, I'm going to just do it in this space here. Let me get a smaller pen. And then let me copy the problem very quickly. I'll just do this. And 
and I'll paste that into my page here. If I can get my mouse to come back. My computer's starting to bog down from all the heat it's generating, actually. I'll do keyboard, I guess. Uh, control V. And I will grab that down here. I'm going to make it small so I can see it when we zoom in. All right, there we go. I'll give us some space to work. And I'll upload these notes. So you'll have this copy as well. All right, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to rewrite the problem like this. This equation can be rearranged as this. P1 V1 is equal to uh, N1 T1 divided by P2 V2 and, I'm sorry, N2 and T2. And that's actually just a rearrangement of this equation. And that's a, it's, I actually like this version better because I can do this with it. And I'll show you. I'm going to make a table. And I'm going to put one here and two here. And this is just an organizational tip. It actually takes up a little bit more space. But it helps for it helps people to keep from making mistakes. And I'm going to put the top P, V, N, and T. So again, this technique, it's a little bit slower and takes up more space, but is less prone to making uh, errors in uh, assigning variables. And then what you do is you think about this square. See this square that I'm highlighting right here? That square is P1, and this square is V1. So that's actually this part of the equation over here. There's an equal sign here, and this is N1, and this is down here, N1. And this is T1, and this is P2, because this variable 2 number here, that's the subscript. Now what I can do is write this. I can read, it says a cylinder contains... 1.5 moles, and I'm not going to write the units, I'm just going to go like that, I'm right at the top, and has a pressure of 35 PSI, so I'm going to write 35 here, and I'm going to put PSI here, at 26.5 degrees Celsius, and I'm just going to add 273.15, that's just automatic. If it's in Celsius, you just convert it directly over to Kelvin, so this unit is Kelvin. And then I'm reading through the problem, and it says if two moles of gas are added, and so two moles, so that gives me 3.5, because it's 1.5 plus 2, and the unit is mole, so I don't need to write that again, are added. And the temperature is decreased to 10 degrees Celsius, so this is 10, right, plus 273.15. Uh, in units of Kelvin. Uh, let's see, what is the final pressure? So that's P2. That's what I'm solving for. And you'll notice automatically that this goes away because there's nothing there. So you can just see what's not being talked about, even though you might not catch it. As long as you're careful, you set up the table and you write everything in as you see it. So now, I've done that. The equation is I need to solve for P2. Now this is where this part of the problem gets trickier. So you can actually save yourself a little bit of agony by setting this table up just to see what variables get canceled out and then going back to this equation and then canceling the variables out. But I'm going to go ahead and do it from this equation. So I have P1 over P2. That's going to be equal to N1 over T1 over N2 over T2, and I got to get P2 by itself, so I'm going to cross multiply the denominators, so I'm going to get something that looks like this P1 times N2 T2 is equal to P2 times N1 T1, and then I'll divide both sides by N1 T1, and I've isolated P2 because these will cancel out. And so I'll have P2 is equal to 
P1 times N2T2 over N1 and T1. And what's the advantage of this technique is, and by the way, let's zoom out just real quick and uh, look at this problem, all right? I arrived at the same equation here that I did here. So I could have done it just like this from the very beginning. Okay, so the advantage of having done it this way, though, is you have all your data laid out in a table. And so you go equals, and then you just read the numbers. Just make sure you're reading the numbers out of the right boxes, but it's already sorted out for you. So you don't have to read back through the question and mark everything, okay? So that's kind of the way I prefer to teach students to do it at first, especially if you have trouble with uh, rearranging equations and things like that. All right, so next section, ideal gas law. I'm going to take another short break on my end, and then you might want to consider taking a break and trying to do some problems and maybe have some coffee and relax a little bit, and then we'll continue from there. Hey guys, I'm sorry I was uh, recording and then I went back and I was doing a little editing and I realized that the little yellow cursor disappeared somewhere along the way. Um, I'm hoping to figure out how to get that back into the video, but I should have it here for the rest of the video. It'll make it a little bit easier for you to see that I'm pointing at stuff, honestly. I don't know what happened there. Okay, so there's something called the ideal gas law. It's one of the equations you'll have to be familiar with using. But if you look at it, it looks a lot like this. P times V is equal to K times N times T. Now, it turns out this K is special. It's known as the ideal gas law constant. Now, we talk about variables a lot in gases, like pressure, volume, moles, and temperature. Turns out those are the four variables that you have to define to completely understand the state of a gas. Now, it turns out if, those, if you know those four variables, you can calculate K. And this value has been given the variable symbol R, and it has a value of 0.08. Two, and then your book uses a 1, so I'm going to stick with that. Uh, liters times atmospheres per mole times Kelvin. And you'll notice that these units that are over here really represent the units of each of the variables inside this equation. So as long as you're using R with these units and you're using the variables with these units, you should always uh, be okay in your calculations in terms of calculating the correct value with the correct units. Now, there's another version of R that's the energy version. And if you remember, we're talking about temperature uh, being related to the energy of a gas. Well, there's a, a joule version of this as well. So how do you use the ideal gas law? Well, you write it out like this, say P V is equal to N, and then instead of K, we use R, T, and you find the variables in the equation. So it says a cylinder contains one and a half moles of gas at 35 PSI and 26 degrees Celsius. What is the volume of the container? So now notice what we've done. When I went through and circled, right, I got four variables. If you're going through and you're getting two temperatures or two pressures, then you know it's not an ideal gas law problem. An ideal gas law problem generally states one set of conditions, that one volume, one pressure, one moles, one uh, temperature, okay? So I'm solving for volume. I'll take this equation, and I'm going to do solve it for V. So I'm going to say V. So that's why I don't have a subscript, right? There's only one set of conditions here, is equal to... P, I'm sorry, NRT over V. So I just divided, uh, P, I just divided through both sides by the pressure. My V looks kind of lame here, so let me fix that. There we go, V. Then what I suggest that students do is do this, P, V, N, T, and then write out your variables. So N is 1.5 moles. That's the first thing I read. My pressure is 35 PSI. My volume is what I'm looking for. And my temperature is 
1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, this is very important. This is different than the empirical gas laws. Your values that you have for your variables, those units, have to match the units of this R. So that means this PSI has to be converted over to atmosphere. So 1 ATM over 14.7 PSI. My moles is okay. So now I've done that. My moles is okay. My temperature, I have to add 273.15. And that'll give me Kelvin. And that answer comes out to be... It turns out to be 299.65. And that's in units of Kelvin. So now what I do is I take those values and I plug them into my equation. So my volume is equal to, and then it's going to be 1.5 moles. And then R is 0 0.082, uh, sorry, 21 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin, <coughs> excuse me, times 299.65 Kelvin. That's my temperature. And then I'm going to divide through by my pressure, which turns out to be, oh, I forgot to calculate that. So real quickly, I'll calculate that. That comes out to be um, 2.38 uh, atmospheres. Only have two sig figs because of the 35, but I'm going to go ahead and keep the 8 until I'm done calculating. So 2.38. ATM. I know my answer will have two sig figs in it. Now, watch what I do here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Throat. Coffee. Um, I'm going to show you how the units cancel. Just so you know that when you do this right, you're going to get the units of volume that you think you're going to get. In other words, when I do this volume calculation looking at the units of R over here, I'm expecting units of liters to drop out of this. Now, I don't necessarily want you just to take that on faith. I want you to see how the calculation works out. So I have moles here, and this is 1 over moles here. So this is going to cancel like this. And then I have Kelvin here, which is going to cancel with the Kelvins here. And now I'm going to divide through by atmospheres. Atmospheres on the top. And there's atmosphere down here, so I'm going to divide like this, and the units that I'm left with are liters. So if I plug, plug that into my calculator, what I get is I get 15.4987. That's a 9. Nice 9. Looks like a 4. 8. 4, 9, 8, 7. Two significant figures in my answer, so I'll end up with 15 atmospheres. Or 15 liters, <laughs> nice, 15 liters, like that, because that's the unit that I was left with. So that's my answer for that problem. So I thought I had the cursor working in this program, but apparently not. I may have to switch to another platform for lectures later, but um, right now the only one I know of is actually a PowerPoint. So, all right, we'll continue on. Uh, Here's another problem using the ideal gas law. What is the volume of one mole of gas at STP? I can use this kind of lame pointer here. Um, I don't really like it, but it's kind of the Microsoft standard, it turns out. Oh, and uh, I don't know if that's going to annoy you. <laughs> you can see where my fingers are touching the screen now. I don't know if you can see it on your end, uh, but on my end it's kind of annoying because I've been fiddling with so many... Uh, things in the program. But anyways, all right. So we want to know the volume of a mole of gas at STP. So we know that PV is equal to NRT. I'll do this in blue, actually. There we go. Um, and I'm going to write PV, N, and T. P, V, N, and T. And we just have to make sure we write down the values uh, with the correct unit. So I want to know the volume of one mole. So N will be one, right? And STP, remember we talked about STP earlier. That's the standard temperature 
and pressure. So temperature is 273.15 Kelvin. And the standard pressure is one atmosphere. So we'll put one ATM here. And this uh, temperature is 273.15. Kelvin, and this is for one mole like that. So we're going to solve the equation for V, and V will be equal to NRT over P. Well, that line's a little long, isn't it? There we go. And so I can write it out like this. One mole, 0 0.0820, oh, sorry, Okay, I'm going to use 206. That's actually the, a more accurate number. And then liters times atmospheres per mole times Kelvin. Um, and then for my temperature, I will write 273. Whoa, I don't know how that happened. I must have hit something with my hand. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll just leave it. Uh, 273.15 Kelvin. And over here, I'll put 1 ATM. That's my pressure. So remember, uh, when we're dealing with things like uh, defined variables, they have an infinite number of sig figs. So even though I wrote 1 ATM here, it's defined as 1 atmosphere. So that number is exact. So you don't have to worry about its sig figs. Ah, so what do I have here? Oh, yeah. So atmospheres will cancel. Moles will cancel. Kelvin will cancel and leave me the units of liters like I was hoping. Uh, and when you do that calculation, you're going to get 22.41 liters. This number is known as the molar volume of a gas. That is one mole of gas at STP. So that's these conditions here has a volume of 22.41 liters. Now, in your book, they'll list that as 22.4. It's three sig figs. This value has a little bit more precision as four sig figs. Okay. All right. So that's the ideal gas law. And you'll get more practice with this uh, as you do the homework. Uh, just remember to be organized. Write your equation. Identify your variables solve your equation, and then make sure your variable units, your, your atmospheres and your moles and your Kelvin, match the units that you're um, using for the value of R. That's these values here. All right? So the ideal gas law can be used to solve a, a number of interesting chemical problems. One is determining the molar mass of a substance. And, and you can do this knowing uh, basically two things. Uh, one is that molar mass, that's the symbol we use for it, is really the mass of a substance divided by, sorry, yeah, by the moles, N. Remember, the units are grams, that would be the units of mass, per mole, and that would be the units of moles. So if you know the mass of a substance and you can determine its moles, you can get its molar mass, or you can determine its molar mass. So the way we do that is by using a balance to figure out the mass, you can just weigh it. So you can take a gas, for example, and seal it in a container and weigh the container with and without the gas. You can get its mass. And you can also determine the moles if you have the information you need for PV equals NRT. And you have to solve this, of course, to give you N is equal to PV over RT. And you should work that out. Make sure you can do that. If you can't, you know, just send me a message. And I can help you work these things out. <clears throat> and so let's take a look at this problem where you're calculating molar mass. It says a sample of gas has a mass of 827 milligrams. And so that's, that's this value. Its volume is 0.279 liters at 88 degrees Celsius and 700 and 975 millimeters of mercury. Find the molar mass. So this is how you would do this. You do it just like an ideal gas law problem. You say P, V, N, and T. 
and you look at the units of pressure and it says 975 millimeters of mercury. The volume will be 0 0.279 liters. Moles is what you're trying to find and T is the temperature. Now it's 88 degrees Celsius, but you need to convert that to Kelvin. So you add 273.15 to it and we'll calculate that value. Now here's the other thing to remember, and I always tell people do this when, when you're first doing these, is write the value for R. It's 0 0.0821, and then the units are liters times atmospheres divided by moles times Kelvin. And this is telling you the units, this is telling you the units that you, all of these P, V, N, and T need to be held at or converted to. So pressure, is not in the correct units. We need to have that in atmosphere. So we'll use our conversion from earlier, 760 millimeters of mercury is one ATM. Liters is fine because the units match for liters, All right? So that's okay. And then uh, temperature needs to be in Kelvin. So I've already set that calculation up. And so what I'll do is I'll convert all these things I'll convert all of these things and I'll insert them into the equation and then we'll do the calculation. So let me do the conversion very quickly. So these are the values that I have and so what I can do now is plug them into the equation. I went ahead and calculated them uh, while I paused the video and say P, oh sorry, the equation is N is equal to and then it's PV, so that'll be 1.2829. It's only three sig figs, but I'll write that out. Atmospheres. V is 0 0.279 liters. And then it's over RT. So R is 0 0.0821 liters times atmospheres divided by moles times Kelvin. And the temperature in Kelvin is 361.15 Kelvin. Now, again, just looking at how the units cancel out, the atmospheres will cancel this way, and then the Kelvin will cancel this way, the liters will cancel this way, and you notice you're left with this unit of moles down here. It's really a one over one over moles, and so that inverts and becomes mole, okay? So whatever number I get from that will be the number of moles I have for uh, my sample. Now, when I do this calculation, n comes out to be this little tiny number, 0. Point, oh, I should probably do it blue, huh? Let me change that real quick. 0. 0.01207, that should be enough sig figs. I think my answer should only have three in it. Um, and this actually confuses people. They're often confused by the fact they have such a small number for the moles. But you have to remember, 22, uh, one, one mole of a gas at STP occupies 22 liters. This is not even, it's just about one quarter of a liter. So um, it's going to be, this value seems to be in line with this volume. It's a small volume compared to 22, so this is a small number of moles compared to one mole. So what we're going to do is calculate the molar mass. Um, I'm going to write out molar mass is equal to, and I have 827 milligrams. Now I'm just going to convert that, but that's a conversion. I just moved the decimal over. Uh, divided by 0 0.01207 moles. And I'm going to do that calculation. And that comes out to be 68.5 grams per mole. That's the molar mass of that unknown. Okay? So the process... Um, Conceptually, it's pretty simple. There's a lot of work involved in doing it, though. So the first bit is to remember that molar mass is the number of grams per mole. Typically, the number of grams will be given to you. So you just have to figure out moles from the ideal gas law, and we use PV equals NRT to solve for that. After that, it's all a bunch of conversions and calculations. Now, I'm going to teach you another property of gases, which is 
um, may be obvious, but it wasn't obvious at the time that this discovery was made. And that is the idea of Dalton's law of partial pressures. You may remember Dalton, he's a chemist actually from Manchester, England, and he was the one responsible uh, for coming up with the modern atomic theory. And his, one of his other theories had to do with the partial pressures of gases. And, and the, the, the law sounds pretty silly. It says, basically, Dalton's law of partial pressures is that the total pressure equals the sum of the partial pressures. Okay, so the biggest problem people have with this is just the terminology, really. Uh, what is a partial pressure? Well, notice in this container it has 0 0.22 atmospheres of O2, 0 0.63 atmospheres of N2, and 0 0.06 atmospheres of helium. And it's asking what the total pressure is. Well, these values, the 0 0.22 or the 0 0.63 or the 0 0.06, these values are part of the whole, so we just call them partial pressures. It's not the total pressure individually. Each one is part of the total, so we just have a different name for them. So what Dalton said was is the total pressure is just the sum of the partial pressures, and so in order to calculate the total pressure of a container from the partial pressures, you can say P total is just 0 0.22 atmospheres plus 0 0.63 atmospheres plus 0 0.06 atmospheres. And then if you do the math for that, you get a value of 0 0.091 atm, and that's the total pressure. So it seems kind of obvious, really. Uh, ways that, that you could use this is you could be given the total and the partial pressures of of some of the gases, and then you'd have to figure out the partial pressure of the last gas simply by subtracting all the other gases off. So we could think of this equation in a sense as P total is equal to the pressure of O2 plus the pressure of N2 plus the pressure of helium. And if you wanted to know the pressure of helium, you would have to be given these other three. You would just subtract the pressure of oxygen and nitrogen from the total, and that would tell you what the pressure of helium is. Another important uh, law of, of gases is known as Henry's Law. And this is, has to do with the solubility, how much gas you can dissolve into a solution. And it's an important uh, concept, especially uh, for people going into medicine, because we often look at the pressure of oxygen that somebody might have in their bloodstream. And those things are actually calculated using uh, how much oxygen can dissolve in blood, for example, or nitrogen or other gases are calculated using Henry's Law when the calculations are done. So it says the solubility of a gas in solution is proportional proportion is sorry proportional to the partial pressure of a gas above the solution. Higher partial pressure of gas means higher solubility. So think about it like this. If I had a container, I've got this thing, I'm gonna move it out of the way so I don't bump it anymore. If I have a container, for example, like a soda bottle, right? This is a really horrible soda bottle, but there's a soda bottle and it's sealed. And let's say there's two atmospheres of CO2 above that, uh, above the liquid in the bottle, okay? So let's say you have two atmospheres of CO2, then there's a solubility of the gas, so I'm going to call it S, of the CO2 in the liquid. What happens when you open the bottle? Well... Uh, your experience would tell you that when you open it, a lot of gas escapes. That gas is primarily carbon dioxide. So what happens when it, this is sealed, when you open it, now you have an open container, and you have CO2, a solubility of CO2 in here, all right? 
this is open to the atmosphere, so the CO2 can leave. And the pressure, the uh, partial pressure of CO2, it's only about, I think it's only about 1 or 2% of the atmosphere normally. So the result is, because the pressure of CO2 is so low, the solubility of CO2 goes down a lot. So by opening the container, you decrease the solubility. And how do you see that? What do you see happen to the soda when you open it? Well, what you normally see is a lot of little bubbles in here. And then as soon as you crack it open, there's a lot of bigger bubbles like this. And that's because the solubility of the CO2 goes down. And the way it precipitates from the solution is by entering the gas phase and forming these bubbles. Now, it turns out bubbles form better when you have more small bubbles. So if you shake a soda beforehand and you open it up, it tends to fizz a lot more than if you don't. Well, oxygen in blood uh, does the same thing. So normally oxygen is around 20% of our atmosphere. But if somebody has trouble breathing, like for example, they're on a respirator because they're having problems with low blood oxygen, what you can do to their air that they're breathing is increase the partial pressure of oxygen. So now normally it's 20%. And if you increase that to 40%, the solubility of oxygen will double in uh, solution. And hopefully people who are breathing that air can absorb more of the oxygen that they need to survive. Now that's a real problem right now. We're going through this uh, virus outbreak of COVID-19, uh, a lot of respirators are being used and what they're doing in a lot of these respirators, increasing the partial pressure of oxygen so people can get more oxygen into their system. But again, by doubling the partial pressure of oxygen from 20% of the atmosphere to 40% of the atmosphere, uh, you're essentially doubling the amount of oxygen available for them to absorb in solution. So there's a type of problem I call a cow problem. And in those problems, uh, we're collecting over water is what that stands for, collecting over water. So uh, what does that mean? So I think some of you probably, when you were young, would take a container. And let's uh, save a little space here. I'm going to use this little space on top. You had water, and you put a container in it upside down like this, and this is full of water, all right? And so the water is at the very top like that. And you would take that container and you would lift it out. And what you would notice is that when you got it to the surface like this, this container was still full of water. And that's because you don't allow air, right? Air can't go in that way. Now, if you stick your head underneath and you blow bubbles in, you can fill the container up. And that actually, those bubbles will contain whatever air that you breathed out into the container. Plus, that will also contain some water vapor because it's collected over water. So that's what the term collected over water means. Now, I want to get a quick, I'm going to move something here real quick, sorry. A quick uh, background um, discussion out of the way first and then we'll just talk about how you do this calculation uh, and it's actually pretty straightforward so uh, don't worry about the calculation so much but let's focus on the concept what's going on so like I said you have this container and let's say it's a bottle because in chemistry we have this device that we use for collecting wa uh, gases over water and this will be, uh, let's say it's methane, because in this problem, uh, we're dealing with methane. Okay, so it says methane gas here. So this is CH4. And there's water down here, so that's the liquid. And then it's usually inside another container. And then there's a little tube that goes like this. And that's effective, effectively you blowing into it. But in this case, we'll have this connected to perhaps an Erlenmeyer flask somewhere else so i'm going to draw a little juncture line here and then somewhere else we would have a reaction vessel like an erlenmeyer flask like i mentioned with the stopper in it and then a tube that goes out like this and 
that's connected down here. So these are actually connected, but it's not underwater, so I didn't want to draw it that way. So inside this reaction, there's a rea or inside this reaction vessel, there's a re reaction. Sorry, that didn't come out very clear. Let me do that again. You have a reaction RXN. And that reaction is producing carbon to, uh, methane gas, okay? Now, just to put that back together, I have a container, it's got water in it, it's full when you start, like this container is, and then you blow bubbles into it with a chemical reaction, basically, and that goes in and fills up this container. So what we have inside this container is we have methane plus H2O gas. Now it turns out... Um, this is an example of a dynamic equilibrium. If you remember the discussion of equilibrium before, um, what happens is, is water, as this container fills, is evaporating off the surface and making water vapor. And at the same time, it's condensing back down. So we have a constant equilibrium. We have a constant value of water vapor inside this container. Now, we would measure that concentration of water vapor by measuring its pressure okay so for example if it's 10 degrees celsius i'll do this with the highlighter if it's 10 degrees celsius then you'd have 9.2 millimeters of mercury there's the units up here uh, of, of water vapor pressure on the other hand if it was 80 degrees celsius then you would have 355 millimeters of mercury of water vapor pressure. So the vapor pressure of the water goes up exponentially, actually, but it goes up as the temperature goes up. And that has to do with uh, a Le Chatelier's principle, where if you increase the temperature, this reaction or this process of water going from the liquid state to the gas state is endothermic and so as you provide it heat energy there's more water vapor in uh, the uh, gas inside the container or inside the air inside the container okay so if we read this problem it's not actually that hard but let's read this problem and work out the details now this is Dalton's law of partial pressure still so we know that the pressure inside the container the total pressure is equal to the sum of the partial pressures and so let's read this problem through it says 125 mils of methane gas is collected over water at a total pressure of 758 millimeters of mercury at 30 degrees celsius and then it's asking what is the partial pressure of methane in the mixture okay So I have methane in my container. So I have a pressure of CH4. And even though it doesn't say water vapor, it's collected over water. So we have to include a term for the pressure of water. So I'll just use W like that. Now, it gives us P total. This is the 100... Let's see, no, it's 758 millimeters of mercury. And then it has a temperature. And the temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. So now what we do is we look up the partial pressure of water at 30 degrees Celsius. And that's 31.8 millimeters of mercury and now what we do is we solve for the pressure of the methane gas so that would be p ch4 is going to be equal to the pressure total minus the pressure of the water so that'll come out to be 758 minus 31.8 millimeters of mercury That'll be 726.2 millimeters of mercury, like that. Okay, and so this would be the 
pressure of methane inside the container. Um, just another term that you'll hear that goes along with this um, this kind of calculation. This is the pressure or the dry pressure. because you've removed the water um, from the mixture. Well, there are also a couple other kinds of problems that we do uh, using gas laws, and those are stoichiometry problems. So in doing stoichiometry problems, the idea is, is you need to convert stuff from moles or to to from moles to something else. So what you're familiar with right now is that we have let's say grams of a substance. Let me get a pen out here. You have grams. Let's see, I'll use a fatter pen actually. Hmm. Nah, don't like that one. Hang on, sorry. Let me use this one. So you have grams of a substance, and in a stoichiometry problem, you would convert that into moles. Let's say of uh, some substance. Let's call it A. So this would be grams of A. And you would use the molar mass to convert grams of A to moles of A. And then would you would use a balanced chemical equation to go to moles of something else. And let's just call that moles of B. All right. And then you can convert moles of B to grams of B. Again, using the molar mass, but you know you use it different than you did initially because now you're going from moles to grams instead of grams to moles. So it turns out the ideal gas law provides us another way to get to the moles of A, and that's using P, V, and T. Because remember, P, V equals NRT. So P, V, and T can be used in general, right? to solve for the number of moles that's here. And then the same thing can be can be done on the other end. You can go from moles of B to pressure, volume, and temperature, provided that you're given like two of the other, right? You can't just know one of them. You have no pressure, volume, and, and temperature in order to do those calculations. Or pressure, volume, and moles, or pressure, volume, and temperature. And those would give you, um, moles, uh, sorry, pressure, moles, and temperature would give you volume, things like that. So you have to have three of the variables, and then you can solve for the fourth. So one way to do that is commonly employed is, um, is using the ideal gas law. And the other one is to use this molar volume of a gas. And you, you can do that provided that it's under the conditions of STP. So let's look at this problem and see how we're going to do this. Is how many grams of magnesium oxide are formed when 12.8 liters of oxygen gas measured at STP reacts with an excess of magnesium metal? Okay. And then I give you the balanced reaction, although you might have to come up with that reaction uh, from your uh, knowledge of chemical reactions. Um, but let's start with, I want to know grams of magnesium of MgO. So that's this. And I have 12.8 liters of oxygen. So what I'm going to need to do, and it's at STP, so I can use this. Okay, that's what that's telling me. So I can say grams of magnesium oxide. I'll start with what I'm given, 12.8 liters of oxygen. And I know it's 22.4 liters, or 41 liters, I guess. I'll use the one, although it doesn't matter that much for this problem, of oxygen for every one mole of oxygen. So what I've done at this point, this is giving me moles of oxygen at that point, because the liters will cancel out. But then I want to go to magnesium oxide, right? Because this is, I want to stop once I figure out what mag, grams of magnesium oxide are, not where moles of oxygen are. So we're going to go from the stoichiometry, it's two moles of oxygen. Oh, 
actually, um, that's not balanced correctly. It's one mole of oxygen. Let's do this. Cross that out. Yeah, it's one mole of oxygen for every two moles of magnesium oxide, MgO, like this. And then I need to get the molar mass of magnesium oxide. And that value is 40.30 grams for every one mole of MgO. And if you're wondering how I got that value, I just did this. You can see that I just Googled it. Now, uh, but you can use uh, your molar mass calculator. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, you know, for the exam, quote unquote, you should be calculating it by hand. But some of that's going to be fair game because um, uh, because the exam's online. I have no way really to control whether or not you're using apps outside of when you're taking the test. Just so you know, though, that's one app that will save you time. But searching for answers for these questions will not save you any time. So you should try to uh, get used to figuring out what works best for you. I'm just going to tell you that up front. So anyways, um, we're going to do this calculation real quickly. We'll calculate 12.8. So I'm going to grab my calculator out here. Right, I have two screens, so that's how I'm doing these calculations. Oh, my calculator is suddenly way too big. Let me uh, <laughs> let me make it smaller. It's just this gigantic thing on the screen. There we go. Oh, it's still too big. Well, I'll make it smaller yet. I'll just hide part of it. I have more of the screen you can't see. So I'm going to go 12.8 divided by 22.41 times 2 times 40.30. And that gives me 46.04. We'll just call it, because it's three sig figs in the answer, I'll just keep the first... Um, uh, three digits, so that's 46.0 grams of MgO. Okay, so again, it's uh, basically a straightforward stoichiometry problem in the sense that once you've got it in moles, you just go from moles to moles to grams or moles to moles to whatever value that you're looking for. Uh, using stoichiometry from the equation. Okay, so now let's look at this problem. It says, if 325 milliliters of hydrogen gas is collected over water. Now this is actually a problem, hopefully, we'll get done for you so that you can actually see this experiment and how it works. Uh, you'll actually be doing this calculation yourself with your, with our own data that we collect in class. Um, of course, you won't be there, but I'll have to try to get this done for you. Otherwise, I might just give you the data. It says 325 milliliters of hydrogen gas is collected over water at 25 degrees Celsius and 748 millimeters of mercury. How many moles is zinc reacted, period? And then I have to give you the reaction. It's zinc plus HCl make ZnCl2 plus H2. And this is my gas like this, and there's a balancing coefficient there. So I have 325 milliliters of hydrogen gas. So I'm looking for, though, moles of zinc reacted. So I'm looking for moles of zinc. Now, what am I given? And it turns out, in this case, normally I would just start with the number here. But what you need first is to do PV equals NRT and solve for moles. So let's see what information we have. Now, we know we have 325 milliliters of hydrogen gas. That's my volume. So I'm going to write that out in liters and let you do the conversion 
yourself, but I just shifted it over three places. So I have 0 0.325 liters. Uh, my temperature is uh, 25 degrees Celsius, so that's 298 Kelvin. So I just um, added 273 and uh, 25 and got 298. And my pressure is the one I have to take care of. It's tricky. It's 748 millimeters of mercury, but it's collected over water. So I need the pressure of hydrogen gas. So the pressure of hydrogen gas is going to be P total minus the pressure, oh sorry, pressure of water. So it'll be P. I'll use the W for the subscript. Now, if you weren't given this number in the question right here, what you would have to do is you would have to go back And look to see that they had at 25 degrees Celsius given you this value 23.8. So you actually have to look it up. So like on homework problems, they won't give you that value. You'll have to go back and look it up. On a test, most likely I would just give you the value. Now, so now what I can write is, hang on, position this a little better, is the pressure of H2 is equal to um, 748 minus 23.8 millimeters of mercury. And so I will go and calculate that real quick. And that's 724.2. And that's millimeters of mercury. Now, in the ideal gas law, the pressure units, I have liters, Kelvin. Remember, we're using R as our guideline. So R needs the value of pressure to be in atmosphere. So now I have one more step to do. Pressure of water, of hydrogen, sorry. In, in atmospheres, what I'm looking for is 724.2 millimeters of mercury times, and it's one atmosphere for every 760 mmHg. Okay? So I'll calculate that value, and that comes out to... 0 0.9529 uh, atmospheres. Now, here's here's what we're at now. We, we've actually, all we've done so far is set the problem up, but we actually don't. What I, first thing I need here is I need moles. This needs to be moles of H2. So what I need to do is uh, calculate the moles of H2 uh, that go here, okay? So now I know PV equals NRT, so I'm just going to rearrange this. It's PV over RT, and I can plug all these values in. Well, maybe made it a little bit close. Let me, uh, let me move that. So I'll move that over to the left, and then I'll go... Um, is equal to 0 0.9529 atmospheres. My volume is three zero sorry zero point three two five. And then I'm dividing by um, let's see. R, which is 0 0.0821, um, I'll just use the book value, liters times atmospheres divided by moles times Kelvin, and then 298. That's my temperature in Kelvin. So it's a lot to keep track of. Let's look at the units. 
and you end up with 1 over 1 over moles, so the answer will be moles. And then when you calculate it, that value will be 0 0.101266. That's a 0 there. It's a small number, but remember, this is what we talked about before. This is moles of H2. This is a small volume, so this is going to be a small number of moles, right? Sorry, a point at it. This is a small volume, so you expect a small number of moles because it 22 uh, one mole occupies 22.4 uh, liters. So you would expect at STP, and it's not STP, but it'll still be a number that's close to that. So we we know that even though that this is a small number, it's probably okay. So that's actually the number. I'm ready to start my stoichiometry part. I have 0 0.01266 moles of H2. And then it's 1 mole of H2 for every 1 mole of zinc. And so it turns out that's a 1 to 1. So I'll get 0 0.0126. Seven moles of zinc reacted, and I just rounded to three sig figs because that's where this answer uh, looks like it should be. Okay, that was a lot of work uh, for that problem, but that's what you need to do in these um, gas stoichiometry problems. You use either the molar volume of the gas when it's at STP and by far, this is the easy way to do it because it's a direct conversion to moles. But if it's not at STP, then what you have to do is you have to go through the whole process of setting up the ideal gas law and solving it for moles. Okay. Once you have the moles, the problem follows the format, straightforward format that you're used to of moles to mole conversion. Okay, so I hope that helps you. This is the uh, end of the chapter. There's a lot of problems, but there's also a lot of help available. Um, I'm pretty sure that Tutorial still has its online tutoring. Um, you should be able to uh, get connected to that by contacting the Tutorial Center. And you know that I'll be available during class times to answer questions about homework. And I'll hopefully have that book up for you on uh Tuesday when we get together so we can sort of scroll through and do problems real quickly. All right, so take care and see you in a couple of days.